Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attention. We're going to get started. Um, Mary. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Vali Steverling. I'm the co-chair of the Freeport Sustainability Advisory Board. And I thank everyone for giving up a beautiful evening to be here with us tonight. Uh, hopefully, this will be a very productive meeting. We have great preparation from GP Cog, our partner in this effort, the Climate Action Plan. And we want to hear all your opinions. And hopefully, we'll be able to gather a lot of good feedback so we can move forward with this Climate Action Plan. So to give a little background, about two years ago, the Town of Freeport and the Sustainability Board started this conversation about how we could provide structure to all the efforts that both the residents and the municipality itself were making towards uh, more sustainable uh, choices. And up until that moment, we had done quite a few things. I don't know how many of you are familiar with what the town has done, but basically about 75% of the electricity that we consume is offset by solar credits. Uh, they're making efforts towards high, uh, including hybrid and electric vehicles in the municipal fleet. Uh, a lot of heat pumps have been installed, LED lights inside the buildings and on the streets. Um, so there have been a lot of great um, moves that have been happening, and I don't know if people are aware of them, but this plan is basically a continuation of the effort that we have been making in the last couple of years, um, but we felt it was necessary to provide structure and uh, also be able to prioritize which are the next moves that we want to make, what initiatives we want to fund. And we are happy that you're here to help us actually decide which are the things that we should be moving on first. And a couple of the things that were major achievements for us uh, as a municipality was not just to get this climate action plan off the ground, but also to be able to hire our new part-time sustainability coordinator, Mary Smith, so welcome, Mehdi. She joined us in May. Uh, she's been fantastic for the few days that she's been here, completely overwhelmed because you came right before this workshop. Um, but I'm going to pass the mic on to her because she's going to introduce GP Cog and give you a little bit of an idea of how the evening will move along. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much, Valley. Um, so this next slide is pretty much just a recap of what Valley said, and which is that Freeport has been doing this work for years and decades even. I made a timeline poster that's in the, in the lobby there, and it's really amazing to think about all the work um, the town and the community has been doing um, in the climate space. So like Valley said, this work to create the climate action plan is really just building on that momentum and the policies and practices um, for a more resilient future in this community. So I am very excited to be working with Freeport, with the Sustainability Advisory Board, um, and with the passionate community members of, of Freeport. Um, so I will introduce GP Cog, um, but I just want a quick reminder. Um, so. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed on Zoom. So if you are on Zoom, you can ask questions by typing them into the chat and we will um, verbalize them in the room and get back to you that way. So without further ado, I will introduce Sarah and Kelly from GP Cog. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm Sarah Millsnap. I'm the Director of Sustainability at the Greater Portland Council of Governments. We're a regional planning organization. We represent 25 cities and towns in the region. Um, and we have been partnering with our member municipalities to work on climate action for a couple years now. Uh, we've been supporting Freeport um, for the past year on getting ready to do their climate action plan, and we're very excited to be a partner in doing the full climate action plan here in Freeport. We're working with Yarmouth as well, which is wonderful to have Medi on board. Um, and we just completed almost a climate action plan in, with Falmouth and um, are supporting Brunswick and North Yarmouth. So we have a lot of um, climate action plans getting started in the region, which is really exciting. Um, so today, I'm really going to try and set the scene a little bit for um, all of the information that you're going to absorb tonight and in the room. Um, so I, I don't want to overwhelm people. So 
we'll try and keep it um, a little high level, and then when you go around to the posters, uh oh, which are falling, <laughs> we'll fix that. Um, you'll get a lot more in-depth um, details you can read on your own. So the just to kind of set the stage, um, so we are, you know, obviously facing a climate crisis. I think that's why we're all here tonight. Um, that really requires long-term planning and decisive action. And as um, a regional planning organization, our hope is to to partner with our organizations to really start um, laying the groundwork. You know, this next decade will really be the most important for planning um, in order to respond to the climate crisis. Um, so we're trying to, you know, do as much as we can to support the work um, and achieve the priorities that, that communities want to achieve. Why does this matter? Well, I think we've all seen the impacts that we're already experiencing due to climate change. Um, you know, really the past, year I can think of more than one storm that has brought um, really um, both expensive and destructive impacts to the region um, on infrastructure, ecosystems, um, impacts to our economy, and certainly our social and, and human infrastructure that are very important. So we, you know, all of the impacts are expensive and they're um, they're costly to our, to our society as well. So I think what we, what we're trying to do is um, focus as much on, on planning and um, trying to build, you know, the more resilient infrastructure and reduce emissions as much as possible. So we're here today to talk a little bit about that. And the way in which we do that is climate action planning, which really is just developing strategies that will reduce emissions, that will build resilience to the climate impacts that we're seeing now and prepare our towns, communities, and our infrastructure for climate change. And the goal really is to hear from you all um, to understand what are your community goals, how to align the climate actions with those goals and those priorities and really protect um, the future and the sustainable future that you'd like to see here in Freeport. And I know you've done a lot of community work already on trying to think about what priorities you have for development in the future and all of that really is quite overlapping with the climate actions that we wanna talk about today. So we don't see it, um, you know, land use planning or other types of planning um, transportation planning as, as in a silo, we really think of them, climate action planning, as bringing all of those together to look at ecosystems, transportation, buildings, everything kind of in one holistic way. So just to, and obviously you play a huge role in that. Um, residents, this is your town, we wanna see, um, we want to be able to support the, the vision that you have for your future here in Freeport. And I'm really excited to see the turnout today. I wanna to thank you all. I know it's not so easy to come to nighttime meetings, um, but really this is the ways in which we want to gather input is really important. But we also have surveys and other ways in which we can try and get um, broader and more inclusive input from the town. So our, I can talk a little bit about our process just to give a high level overview. And <clears throat> I can take questions or you can come find me during, during the, the next period and we can talk about you know any questions you have about process, but I'll just give a highlights here. Um, so we have been working in the past couple of months. It takes usually about a year, um, give or take. We have been working the past few months with report on the data collection piece, and that is sort of the, tonight as a result of that data collection that we've been doing, both on the emissions side, but also on the vulnerability side. So um, there's obviously a great advisory committee. We're really excited to have the Sustainability Advisory Board supporting this work. They've helped a ton with the planning community engagement. We've been working uh, with Medi and with others in municipal staff to do the data collection piece, which we'll get more into the types of data that we've been collecting when we dive, in, dive into the GHG emissions inventory results and the vulnerability assessment. So the emissions inventory and vulnerability assessment set sort of two different baselines that help inform the action planning. And the action planning, we're gonna have a similar um, workshop in a few months in the fall to help kick off the action planning part of this, of this work. And we're kind of drafting the climate action plan the whole time as we're going along so we don't just sit down one day and write it, but we have um, the emissions inventory and the vulnerability assessment, which will be appendices, and then we're really thinking about the actions that we'd like to start developing the whole, as we go along. And then moving into implementation and tracking progress after that. So this is where we're at um, in the process here in Freeport. Uh, having the vulnerability assessment workshop, and then we'll take all of your input um, and integrate it into drafts of those baseline reports, and then start to move forward toward, towards the climate action planning phase. 
So you'll see here, we'll, we'll get a little bit of input tonight on priorities of action planning, but we're really here tonight to start to talk about this first phase that we've been in, which is the emissions inventory and the vulnerability assessment work, work that we've been doing. So I'm gonna introduce Kelly, who's the sustainability coordinator um, for GPCOG, and she is the one that has really uh, closest to this data, the, uh, especially the vulnerability data here in Freeport. So she can talk a little bit about that and the climate hazards and climate impacts that we are seeing right now. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so part of this co data collection process is we're going to look at things all the way from the state level to the region and then try and get as local as possible. Unfortunately, we don't have all the data sets that we want just for Freeport. So we have to look at a range of data sets. Um, and a lot of our information does come from Main Won't Wait, um, the uh, scientific assessment that the state has done. And so we use that kind of as a baseline to understand what is going on in your town and what should we look at and why should we care. Um, and so Maine Won't Wait, um, there's nice statistic. Of, um, transportation right now currently accounts for 54% of all of Maine's emissions. And as we dive into the greenhouse gas inventory, you'll see how much transportation emissions are specific to Freeport. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about climate hazards. So the things that, um, as climate change is occurring, what um, that actually hap or what actually happens, um, and what the effects are. Um, and one thing that we're seeing is warmer temperatures. Um, over the past century, uh, temperatures have risen over three degrees, and that's most pronounced among along the coast. Um, and it's projected to continue to increase even upwards of four degrees by 2050. Um, and this can cause a range of impacts from human health impacts such as heat stroke or Lyme disease, um, increased asthma from air pollution, um, to different uh, effects on the agricultural and ecosystems. Um, we're seeing already that due to the warming temperatures that we are shifting the growing seasons by almost two weeks. Um, and so that means on one hand, more time for farmers to grow, but on the other hand, means less winter tourism. I know um, even this last winter, I did not have a chance to go skiing as much. Um, and I know that even up north that have a big uh, snowmobile uh, industry that they were shut down for a long time. And so even though that's not always as direct to Freeport, it impacts the broad economy um, and all throughout the state. We're also seeing changing precipitation. Most specifically, we're seeing an increase in precipitation, um, even by um, upwards of 15% since 1895. Uh, and this is shifting. So even though we're seeing an increase of annual precipitation, we're seeing a decrease in snowfall. So more of it is falling as rain, and it's falling more frequently and more intensely. And this is actually one of the, gonna be the biggest impact to Freeport is inland flooding. Um, we are going to talk about sea level rise in my next slide, um, but you have a decent number of waterways, creeks, rivers, and as precipitation keeps increasing, as development growth uh, keeps happening, you are going to see more flooding inland um, compared to just sea level rise. So this can affect your water quality, all of your wastewater systems, um, and then also damage your infrastructure, your roads, uh, your houses. Um, even anything in your property, uh, farms. As I mentioned, sea level rise. Um, around um, Portland, sea levels have risen about seven and a half inches since 1912. And again, they're still projected to increase. And um, with even just higher sea levels, you're gonna get more nuisance flooding or sunny day flooding. Um, that means that you're going to experience flooding even when there's not a big storm. Um, typically we don't have um, many of those, but those are going to increase. Um, the nice thing is that Freeport has a relatively rocky coast right now, and so while sea level rise is going to impact you in some, it's not going to have the greatest effect on you as it might have on other coastal towns. Um, that's not to say that you shouldn't care about it, um, but it's just saying that there are different ways that your town is going to be impacted by climate change compared to other towns. And the last hazard that I'll talk about is broadly changing ocean conditions. So that means both uh, temperature, so the oceans have been warming, and in fact, Casco Bay has been warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. Um, the advisory board actually nicely had GMRI come to give a talk on that a few months ago now, so I think um, recommend checking that out. 
Um, but the oceans are also becoming more acidic, um, meaning that as carbon increases, it's changing the makeup and chemical composition of the ocean. And that's going to impact all of the species, which impacts your economy, your fishing industry, everything that you know, marine economy relies on, that's gonna change. We're already seeing already shifting uh, lobster industry as that moves north um, due to the warming waters. We're seeing more invasive species due to that acidic water. So we talk about the climate hazards as what is actually happening. Um, and then we often say, okay, well, how does that impact you? But the other side of things is your impact is gonna be determined by your existing vulnerabilities. And that means that not everyone experiences things equally. Um, I kind of sometimes use the example for sea level rise that Freeport has a rocky coast, um, a more bluffs compared to say Scarborough. So as sea level rises, Freeport is a little more um, buffered from sea level rise compared to Scarborough, even though the sea level is rising the same amount, your impacts are gonna be different. And that's because of your existing vulnerabilities. So we're looking at vulnerabilities both from an infrastructure side, ecosystem side, and also social. All of you are going to be impacted and that's sometimes the most important to think about. Um, so social vulnerabilities. This can be anything from housing to demographics to um, socioeconomic. I mean, we look at a range of factors and we have a lot more on, board, on the boards, both um, in person and online. But to give an overview, social vulnerability is really what um, is internal to you. Um, so not everyone across town is going to experience the impacts of climate change equally. Um, and that is also not to say that if you fall within these certain categories that everyone within that certain demographic is even gonna experience everything equally either. Um, age is a good one to talk about. So typically people who are, are older often have more existing health conditions. They might have more mobility problems and getting around in case there's a climate disaster, whether that means driving, whether that means relying on someone else to um, get them resources. And so it can be harder for someone who is older to respond in a climate disaster. Similarly, those who are very young um, don't have always the immune system. So as we talk about human health impacts, they might not be able to regulate their temperature. They might be more susceptible to those uh, tick-borne diseases. On the housing side, um, one thing we also look at is um, age of housing. And that's not to say that everything that is an older house is run down. Some people have done very well renovating and upkeeping the older housing stock in Maine, um, but oftentimes older housing doesn't have the same building codes, might not have been upkept as well. So when a big storm comes, whether it's wind or flooding, um, it might be more susceptible. And with that comes affordability as well. Um, and we're seeing that a lot across the entire greater Portland region is people being able to afford their rent, their mortgage, or even just being able to find a place to live. Um, if you are spending a lot more, so if you are cost burden, that is thir spending 30% um, or more of your income on housing costs, um, you are considered cost burden, and that is going to limit how you can respond to a climate disaster. So looking at Freeport, um, for example, renters are typically more cost burden um, than homeowners, and that's not to say that um, anything against renters, but one, Renters have a limited say as to what they can do to their housing, so they can't always put in heat pumps, they can't weatherize their home. Um, they also might be newer to the area and not know all of the great social resources that are around should an emergency strike. And so understanding how people within Freeport respond to climate change, um, who is in your town, how it might impact them, is gonna be important to know where to prioritize resources um, and where to kind of strategize in the future. We also talk about ecosystems. Um, so Freeport has already over 3,000 acres of conserved land, um, which is great, and I know you are doing a lot of great work to continue to conserve that. Um, there's still other areas that can be conserved as well. Uh, the more kind of tree cover, natural areas that you have, um, the better water quality, and um, the better uh, you will be set up to kind of uh, weather those climate impacts. And so, again, we'll, a lot of the posters will dive into this a little more into detail, um, but looking at things, we have looked at things um, to consider coastal erosion. 
you have great bluffs, but if they erode, um, that's gonna cause problems. So we've collected data from um, the state. Um, I will say that some of this data as we go through might be a little outdated, um, and that's where we also want your feedback and your input to say, hey, that might not sound right. I don't think you know, that's the correct area. We want that feedback as well. Um, you know, um, so things like marsh migration, understanding how you're developing is going to impact your conserved lands. As tidal marshes are great uh, buffers for storm surge, uh, for sea level rise, but if you are developing around those areas, as the sea level rises, as the marsh uh, tries to move inland, it's going to be cut off and you're going to lose that natural buffer. And so understanding where are uh, marsh migration happening, where should it happen, it, could it happen in the future, and so where can we conserve? Those are the types of things we're trying to look at. Didn't show up. Um, and then I think lastly, uh, broadly to talk about infrastructure. Um, that can include your roads, transit system, buildings, um, any marinas, you know, we know that there's a big um, shellfish, aquatic, uh, you know, economy in Freeport, and so understanding how all of this can be impacted. Um, so we have partnered with, uh, it's called First Street Foundation and their flood factor model, and so it looks at also inland flooding as well, so not just sea level rise, but understanding how are your roads and infrastructure gonna be impacted uh, by 2050 under a 100 year flood. And so doing kind of a brief analysis with that of understanding what potential roads could be flooded. Um, so if you're going to have flooded roads, it might cut off neighborhoods, it might cut off access to people, it could impair emergency services. So understanding how that movement happens. We've also are looking at uh, buildings and so understanding and properties. So if it's going to flood, how many buildings might be impacted? How many property values? Um, and I will say that right now, a lot of this is initial uh, data findings and data analysis, and we continue to um, explore it a little more to understand what are further economic impacts of this. Um, and so this is, again, where we want some of your input um, and feedback to understand what, what are we missing? What, do we need, what else do we need to know? Um, is there something else that we haven't seen yet? Um, so any of that is always welcome. With that, I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you, Kelly. So I'll just talk <clears throat> a little bit about the greenhouse gas inventory real quick, and then we'll let you start to look more in detail at the posters. So we've conducted a greenhouse gas inventory measuring the emissions that occur within the boundary of Freeport. Um, we have some initial results about the, the total amount of emissions, and this is measuring emissions from the year 2019, not the year right now, because the pandemic made things a little bit funny, so there was a couple years there that um, would have not been super accurate to measure emissions from 2020 necessarily, and even 2021, and then 2022 doesn't have all of the data complete yet. So we went back to 2019 to try and get a good picture of what emissions were in a more kind of normal times. So when we talk about emissions that we're measuring, we're looking at different scopes, and that really just means scope one would be um, any direct emissions that occur in the town, that's you know burning of oil to heat your home, that's electricity used in your home, um, that's transportation that occurs you know driving around within Freeport. Um, then scope two, we measure emissions from the energy that's supplied to the grid. So that would be um, in all of the electricity that's, that's used within Freeport, we measure emissions from that grid. And then SOAP 3, it includes sort of some, some basically emissions that support direct activity within the boundary of Freeport. So this is, say, like waste you send to a landfill outside of the boundary of Freeport. We measure those emissions because you generated the waste within the town. So just to, to give you a little bit of a, um, and there's obviously, <laughs> there's lots of detailed, more technical details that I could get into and happy to answer more questions. Um, but you'll see in the results, um, so we did a, a, both a municipal um, measuring of emissions, so looking specifically at the emissions that are under control of the operation of municipal 
government. And then we did a community-wide inventory that includes those. So the municipal em emissions accounted for 1% of the overall community emissions. And we looked at the buildings and facilities, um, streetlights, traffic signals. You see m municipal vehicles make up a much larger percentage, and that'll be the same with community emissions as well. <clears throat> So here are the, the sort of high level results. Uh, transportation makes up 62% of emissions of your total emissions profile in the town, which is actually higher than the state, um, overall state level of 54% of emissions come from transportation. Um, and 33% come from what we call stationary energy. And you can see here, that's really both residential and commercial buildings and the different types of fuels and electricity that are used in those buildings. Um, so under transportation, you can see the split between passenger and commercial vehicles and then much smaller for buses, et cetera. Um, and waste is a much smaller um, portion of emissions, but it certainly is, um, is makes up some of your emissions here. So um, this is kind of initial uh, assessment. We'll have a report that goes into much more detail, but these the posters here have a little bit more detail as well. Um, and then we really, the reason we do an emissions inventory is so we can start to think about how to re reduce your emissions. So tonight we will be asking you to kind of weigh in on um, a pathway for reducing emissions. So when you're doing a climate action plan, you want to have some sort of target into the future where you reduce emissions at some point so that you can kind of work backwards from that to understand what types of actions would you need to do to um, hit that target. We have the state target right here, the main non weight target, which is a 45% reduction in emissions by 2030 and then 80% 80 80 by 2050. The science-based target is really just a target that um, an international network of cities has come up with and they've done an analysis of the one and a half degree um, target to keep emission, to keep uh, temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this science-based target is more in line with that. Um, so that's net zero by 2050 and a 30% reduction by 2030. Um, as part of the climate action planning process, we are going to ask the council um, and municipal staff to look at agreeing on an emissions reduction target and setting it before we kind of move into the climate action planning part of this work. So we have some poster over there today and John and I will be over there to answer any questions you have about these, these targets. So Kelly will come up and tell you a little bit. Oh, well, sorry. Actually, this is my part, I think. <laughs> so next steps, not next steps tonight, but next steps in the process of the climate action planning. Like I said, we'll get all of your input tonight, um, especially around, you know, we'd love to hear more about vulnerabilities that you're concerned about, about challenges that you already see in your community, um, whether that is to infrastructure, you know, particular populations you're concerned about, or ecosystems you'd, we'd like to um, be focused on protecting. And then some input on the emissions pathways, and we'll take all of that back um, and work with METI and the Sustainability Advisory Board to kind of um, pull that together and have some, some drafts ready so that we have a clear sort of focus on how to move into the climate action planning piece um, and start to draft the actions that will make up the bulk of the report, which is to say, what are you going to do to address the vulnerabilities we've identified? Um, what are you gonna do in order to reach the target that you have set already? And that will be the next phase. So there will be another um, workshop just like this, but focus much more on the actions that we're planning for the future. And that will be um, this fall sometime. So we now are going to set you free into the room and um, Kelly can come up and talk a little bit about which stations we have and what kind of input we're looking for. Oh, yes, we have a question in the audience here. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay. How you assessed the community uh, transportation number that's so high? Yes. How did you measure that? And is it in visitors? Is it, you know, how did you, we'd just love to, because it's that so high. Yeah, sure. So we use um, a software called Streetlight, which measures the actual cars driving around in your town. Um, and so using that data, we can capture the emissions. So it there's some complicated percentages is 
it factors in. So whether a trip started in Freeport and then left the boundary and came back, or whether it was a trip that just drove around Freeport. So they can actually measure that streetlight can tell. Um, so it is fairly accurate. It's not like modeled emissions where we just were sort of modeling, you know, based on say vehicle numbers or something like that. Um, it's actual transportation uh, movement data. Yeah, that's okay. I can restate the question for the people. Yeah, the does I mean does this like account for all of the increased sales for people coming to the different outlets and LL Bean and all of that? Um, those yeah. are those are emissions that this community can't exactly directly control or influence. Yeah. So the question was whether that accounts for um, trips of visitors and those coming who to frequent you know shopping and that kind of thing in Freeport. It does the emissions, the transportation emissions does capture that activity because it does occur within your boundary. Um, so the like I was saying, the emissions is really focused on like what happens within the boundary of Freeport. Um, and so that activity and that economic activity, you know, is happening here within your boundary. And so we do capture those emissions, even if they may not live here, but it is people coming to do trips within the boundary. Yep, in the back. Is that going to be a continuous process that you measure it or a one time? So um, the question, I think you captured the question. Okay, so the question was whether we're gonna to continue to measure it. So within the um, climate action plan, we'll, in our, we'll suggest a sort of a, a period of between every two and three years that the town revisit their emissions to see. So it can be kind of a burdensome process. So we usually suggest you don't do it every year. Um, and it also takes time for emission reduction activities to kind of take hold and start to work, right? So we, we wanna see, um, we'll have a, types of indicators that are not a full emissions inventory, but that can help tell you what direction you're moving in that you can measure every year. Like how many electric vehicles are there in your community? How many charging stations do you have? That kind of thing. That can be metrics for measuring progress, but aren't a full emissions inventory. But the emissions inventory we, we would suggest doing every two or three years. And I will say there is a lot of technology that is pushing forward very fast in terms of emissions monitoring um, that may sort of make these more burdensome inventories less relevant. Um, so like real-time emissions monitoring is something that cities are looking at. Um, so I think we'll see that field start to change as well too. Okay, so if those are all the questions for right now, I'll have Kelly come up and explain the, um, the stations and then you can always come please and ask more questions. We'll be around the room. So here you go, Kelly. And I will also say we're, there will be more time for questions as well at the end, um, but we also invite you as we are walking around to ask us questions as well. Um, I will get to the online participation, so anyone who is on Zoom, um, I will get to that on the next slide as to how you can see all of the posters and get involved as well. Um, but around the room, um, I'll actually start over here to my left. Um, so here we're looking, starting to look at a little bit again of what strategies, what potential priority areas, broad areas. We're not right now getting into specifics. Um, so we ask, we have some, some dots that if what you think is most important for the town to address, what areas um, do you want the town to really focus on? Put a green sticker. Um, if there's ones that you say, you know what, it is important, but it doesn't have to be a priority right now. Um, you can put a red sticker. Um, or if there's other ideas that come to your mind, um, and if there are certain strategies that you're thinking about, please write it down on a post-it as well. Um, there's a lot of post-its, lots of pens around. Any idea that pops into your head, um, write it down and put it on a poster. Um, I'll go over to the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, over here, this again shows kind of the results of the inventory um, and the emission reduction scenarios. Again, if you have any comments, um, please talk to any of um, the GPCOG staff or the Sustainability Advisory Board around. Um, any questions, comments, put it on a post-it. On the table are the two reduction scenarios. Um, put a green sticker on the one that you would want Freeport to support and you would want the town council to adopt. Um, if there, you have another, something else you don't agree with either one, put it on a post-it note. Um, you'll hear me say that a lot, put it on a post-it note. Um, any, any comments? Um, along kind of the back wall um, and over 
to the back of the room are all of vulnerability, infrastructure, ecosystems, social vulnerability, um, different types of how they are impacted by climate change, what is going on in Freeport. Um, I will be over there, other uh, committee members again, please feel free to talk to us um, and provide any comments. Um, what are we missing? What are you concerned about? Um, any of your ideas. On the table in the back is a blank, a pretty much blank map of Freeport with roads. If there is a specific location that you are worried about um, or thinking about, is there something, um, a place that is flooded? Is there invasive species in a place? Is there um, a vulnerable population that you're really concerned about? Um, put a little dot on it, write on it, put a post-it note. Um, you're free to draw on the map, circles, um, Mark it up as much as you want to let us know where in your town specifically you are concerned about anything or you want us to know. Um, you'll also see um, on the back wall, there's kind of more high level questions. Um, that's for, open for you to tell us anything. Um, what gives you hope for the future? What other um, steps are you taking to reduce uh, climate change in your own life? Um, please feel free to put up as much as you want. Um, there's also, You'll see, you don't have to take this now, it'll be up for a long time, but you'll see QR codes around. We have an online survey that asks a lot of similar questions. Please feel free to fill that out um, and send that all to your friends as well. Um, I don't know the timing if, are we on time for 7.30, okay. Um, we're gonna mingle around um, and ask questions and, and then we're gonna reconvene at 7.30 for a report back. Um, all the committee members and us will kind of let you know what we've been hearing and follow up with Q&A. Um, for those who are participating online, and this is also being recorded, so if you have a lot of friends and family who aren't here, um, this is gonna be up. Tell them to go and visit the website um, and they can participate um, over the next month or so. But um, for anyone else on the freeportclimateaction.org website, there is a community workshop page. Um, on there, there is an interactive mirror board that has all of these same posters with post-it notes, um, all of the same exhibits and ways for you to interact and provide the same comments, um, the same dots and stickers um, and provide feedback that way. We also, um, and again, you can take the survey that is also on the website. Um, we can't hear the people who are on Zoom talk, so, but we have someone monitoring um, the chat, so please make sure to enter uh, any questions into the Q&A on Zoom, and we will uh, get back to you when we come back as a group as well. So take the survey, attend um, all future events. As Sarah said, we are doing a workshop in the fall, um, and so make sure you come back and you stay on the website and stay updated. So we can break, oh yeah, go ahead, question. You said that this information is on the town website now and to be interactive. Who do you contact as an individual that would walk you through of how to do those things at the town, on the town website? Oh, that's a great question. Maddie, maybe you can answer. Yeah, so this information is on actually the Climate Action Planning website, which is a separate website, but I would be your main contact at the town, and I am in the office three days a week, um, so I'm happy to sit down with anyone and help walk through the, the data, the information, and gather feedback through just one-on-one -on -one conversation as well. So I have my contact information on a flyer. Make sure you see that as you head out. Sure, yeah, so the website is www.freeportclimateaction.org. And so that's our main hub of information and planning updates um, and events that the advisory board is hosting. Great, okay, so I think we're uh, ready to break and I will meet you over at the stations, thank you.
or just a location on All right, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to call everybody who's left here back together. Um, I think we did have one question on the Zoom. And if anybody has any remaining questions, now would be a great time. Just let everybody get settled. So thank you so much for your feedback. There is lots of dots. There's lots of stickies that I see. I had some really great conversation and suggestions um, from others walking around, so I really appreciate that. I got a great suggestion to potentially look at, um, do a snapshot of transportation emissions from February and then from August, or tra transportation trips, um, so we can really start to see maybe more specifically the impact of um, tourism in, in Freeport. So that was a great suggestion. I saw lots of great dots on the map back there. So we're, we're really excited to dig into all the comments. Um, Anna, what was the question in the chat? What will need to shift so that biking is recognized as a legitimate transportation and visibly supported? Great. That's an excellent question. So, and you know, when we're looking at transportation, there's sort of two approaches to reducing emissions from transportation. One is to electrify vehicles, and the other is just to reduce the number of vehicles and the number of trips that we take. So focusing on biking infrastructure and active transportation options is a really great um, and one of the more impactful uh, actions that we'll be looking at to include in, in the Climate Action Plan. And there's a number of ways to do that, certainly through land use policies, through encouraging um, public transportation and active transportation. So those will be um, actions that we look at within the action plan for sure. Is there any other questions? Yeah, John. Uh, so in a couple of uh, things that I wrote down, um, I, I recommended that Freeport lobby the state to, you know, for example, um, perhaps ban combustion appliances in homes. Uh, I know that states, you know, New York maybe, or that could be a city thing, but um, and California is, you know, set a timeline for no more internal combustion vehicles. Um, is that something that the town can push at the state level? So we have seen, like in, in One Climate Future, the um, Portland and South Portland plans, they have highlighted ways in which they would like to focus their advocacy power um, to push for certain state level actions or um, that would be helpful to, sort of, to municipal action. So it's certainly something that towns can do and the Climate Action Plan is a great time to, to look at those advocacy priorities and see um, so you can, we can certainly include, look at that and include that in an action plan to focus um, sort of lobbying efforts because obviously there is a much more that you can all do collectively together and regionally with other towns as you team up to look at um, the types of actions that you want to take across the region, not just in Freeport, um, and you're sort of stronger to, together than you are apart. So we can definitely look at, at actions like advocacy. Other questions? Yeah. Quick follow up to that. Quick follow up to that. How GP Cog seems to be a great catchment area for such a lobbying effort. Is there any path for us to work with other towns via GP Cog to get them to? get something through the legislature. Yes, thank you. We are a great path for that. Um, so we're a regional planning organization. We, you know, help represent our members' um, needs and challenges. And so it is a great place to work with other towns. Um, I convene a sustainability roundtable, uh, try and do it every few months, at least quarterly, where people can bring issues like that and talk with other communities about the ways in which they're addressing them. So we've had conversations about the stretch code and trying to push other communities, for example, to adopt stricter building codes. Because if you know one town does it, it's, it's one thing. Developers might just go over there. But if we all do it in the region, so that's a great example of the types of kind of regional efforts that are much more impactful uh, across many towns than there are in just one town. And GPCOG is a great 
um, a great venue for that. That really is the, the core of what we do is help to convene um, and represent all the voices that we, that we represent in the region. Other questions? Yes, in the back. So I was just wondering how you might address what I think is a particular challenge for Freeport because we are a town that is very retail based and the answer to climate change, the crisis is producing and consuming less stuff. We have to buy less, we have to make less, we have to use less. We have all the technologies we need to combat climate change. We just need to embrace them and buy less, do less. So how is Freeport going to address that in our action plan since we are such a retail-based community? Does anybody have the answer to that? <laughs> there we go, sales tax. Yeah, so what I would say, I think there's multiple ways right, to either through regulatory or through influence. And, and I think the power of influence, I was talking with Kathleen about this, that you know, attacking the, the issue from multiple different angles, whether it's looking at regulatory responses or it's looking at, at um, you know, the power that neighbors have to influence each other. I think all of those are possible and, and some are more effective than others. So I think it, it's a great question to ask and it's certainly something that we can explore um, and ask for more targeted input in the action planning um, workshop in the fall is, is sort of how to address the issue that this is really, and this drives a lot of the transportation, you know, the high transportation emission numbers. It's really an economic center, um, an ec economic activity center for the region um, and helps support um, a lot of that kind of retail that's in the region, so. Oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you for uh, all the work here. Um, I'm very curious though, and this is not a, a pejorative or a negative question. It really is something I would note in many, many venues, the lack of youth, mm -hmm. the lack of younger voices in all of this. And I'm, I bet that there's already been an effort made with RSU5 or the schools. Is all of this being uh, uh, sent or, or, or promoted throughout the school system to get the kids' voices heard too? Yeah, I'll have Bali answer that. <laughs> Yes, Susan, thank you so much for that question. Uh, yes, the middle school and the high school are both going to distribute the entire survey to all of the student populations. And you don't see all of these boards at the hallways in the schools, but all the ones that you see at the library and the ones that you see at the town hall, which are pretty remarkable um, and pretty impactful, are um, tapestries on the hallways at the schools right now. So right after this event, um, they will administer those surveys. And usually they get a really high participation because they do it during the school day, during advisory. So it's either that or you study. So the survey is always more fun. <laughs> Got a question over here. Yeah. Is that on? Yeah. Now, what I noticed was uh, I can see 16 charging stations from my house. And I think uh, Freeport has the densest number of level two and level three chargers of any town of this size in Maine, or any, you know, in the Northeast here. So uh, I don't, you know, the, the people that have EVs probably know it because they can see it on their apps. But to me, it would help to point out to people, hey, you come shop here, you, you don't have to worry about charging your vehicles. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I come to L.L. Bean to charge my car frequently. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that's a, it's a great sales pitch. And, you know, as we see numbers of electric vehicles um, increase and a lot more people who um, aren't homeowners get electric vehicles, even more charging will be necessary at retail places, at workplaces, because people won't be able to charge at home, which predominantly right now most EV owners charge at home because they're higher income, they own their own homes. Um, but as we start to see that shift and really start to expand, we'll need even more. So I think that's a, a great sales pitch for the community. Yeah. Uh, an update on chargers. Tomorrow night, the town council is actually going to be discussing exactly that topic. There's a proposal on the docket to install level two chargers, banks of six chargers at each of the municipal lots at the train station, the library, and the town hall. And we are applying to efficiency main grants, but they require 15% matching from the town. 
So that amount needs to be included in the budget, and they will be discussing it tomorrow. So if you want to show up at town hall tomorrow, um, you can write to the town councilors too. The other thing that they will be discussing is the possibility of partnering with a private enterprise to install that level three charger. Uh, those are very expensive. So it's uh, a company that is now negotiating with the town and it would really be helpful if residents also address the town council um, voicing their support for that. Tree proclamation. Tomorrow night? Tomorrow night, also something about trees. Code. And stretch code. Stretch code, EV charging trees. There's much to be discussed. All tomorrow. All tomorrow. So please, if you have it in, you come back out tomorrow night. Other questions, thoughts on what you saw around the room tonight? Yeah, in the back, Susanna. Um, thank you very much. Just a quick question, looking at especially the posters over on that side. I was struck by the fact that we tend to focus on very siloed ideas and you know, looking at things like public health, for example, that ties directly into, say, food security, air quality, um, waste reduction, as we've had a lecture here a little while ago that was tying waste reduction to food. Um, and just wondering how, what plans we have to sort of make this a little bit more of maybe a coherent arrows connecting to different things and looking at how everything is interacted, especially if we are by asking people, and I should probably know more about this at the moment than I do, but if we're asking people to prioritize what they feel is important versus not important, and just by looking at that, you know, we can, like, I see where maybe we're not making some of those connections that we really should, especially if we're trying to implement this into a cohesive project. And I'm just wondering what, pro what pathways there are for that going forward. Great, that's, that's a really great question. And yeah, I think the process of prioritizing is, is very challenging because obviously all of these things are interconnected and important. And as we start to develop um, the climate actions, what happens a lot is you know we're trying to figure out where to put actions because everything's interrelated. And so we try and put some organization around it to say, you know, these are addressing particular sectors, but you're right, everything is very much intertwined. I think the hope, you know, we can't, there's a finite amount of money, time, and energy to address um, certain climate actions. So I, so I think what we're, we're trying to do, at least, is to push people to think a little bit about, given finite resources, where do you think is sort of most important? But you're right, that doesn't mean that you think that public health isn't important. It just might be addressed in a different way. And we can use the Climate Action Plan as a kind of foundational document to make those connections. And I think... That's what we try to do um, is, you know, it is focused on climate action, but climate action means lots of different things. And so it's going to have connections to the comprehensive plan. It's going to have connections to public health plans, to transportation planning, to land use planning. So we'll call those out in the climate action plan and talk about how the town can look to, you know, coordinate, align the, the targets. And, you know, I think this is a great time to be doing this because there is going to be work going on with the comp to update the comprehensive plan, there was just work going on to look at downtown visioning. So we will definitely try to make those connections in the climate action plan and, and sort of reinforce that. But I agree, this particular activity does make it look pretty siloed. So that's great feedback. Yeah. Um, to follow up on what you said, there'll also be changes, I'm sure, to ordinances such as zoning, and that'll be connected with everything you said. But I'm wondering how finances is tied in because certainly there's funding in certain areas and not in others and I've heard nothing about money except you did mention it a little bit there and that may have some determining factor in what what a priority is based on what funding is available. Can you comment on that? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. So one of the things that we will look at um, is doing kind of a funding overview of, of what funding is available, which is a bit of a snapshot in time, right? It's sort of capturing what's happening right now with this particular federal administration and the state um, funding. But we can we can talk, what we'll probably do is something like a scale of looking at certain actions, maybe like $3 signs because they're super expensive and we can reference 
ways in which those could be financed or funded, whether that's grant funding or particular types of um, financing mechanisms. So we can't do like a full economic analysis of every action, but we can definitely include in the climate action plans, one, a section about funding and how, you know, not all of this, all of these actions are not going to be taxpayer funded and they're not going to be funded through any one, um, you know, like the, the capital investment plan for the town. There's a lot of grant funding. There's a lot of incentives, rebates. So we'll talk about the various ways in which some of it can be financed. And then, you know, as actions are taken forward by by METI, the sustainability coordinator, and the council starts to look at particular actions, they can kind of dig into the details of how they might get funding for a particular action, but we'll highlight, you know, broad level um, areas within the federal and state government that you could get funding for particular things. Yeah. Hi, I think you've done a really great job and your work's extremely well organized and well presented, so I appreciate that. Um, to serve in a little different angle. I wonder in terms of, do you have any branch of this that's looking to more radical ideas? That things are just way out there and just to get those bubbling and... and it. <laughs> um, I will say this. This is meant to be your climate action plan. This is Freeport's plan. So anything that bubbles up from Freeport, that's an idea that you want to do in your town, we're happy to, to consider and include. Ultimately, this has to be adopted by the, the council and enacted by the municipal staff and the municipal government in Freeport. So those are constraints, I'm sure that you know. But I think at the end of the day, you know, this is what we want to hear from, from public is, is engagement and input around the types of actions that you want to see. Seems like the, the sense is very well done in terms of reasonable goals. But then if you look over the codes, there's kind of this idea of the codes, then there's the stretch codes, yep. and there's all this work that goes into the stretch codes, yep. and then flipping those into the, in the base codes. So I, don't know, I think I hear what you're saying, but it has a sense that maybe it's too easily uh, letting go of kind of brainstorming, evaluating crazy ideas mm -hmm. and seeing maybe latching onto one of those. Well, I hope to see you at the action planning uh, workshop and, and bring all your crazy ideas. We're happy to, happy to hear them. Yeah. Is it on? Um, as I was spending a lot of time over here in this corner, there are a couple of things that came to mind. One is that the red dots on the public health and, and um, air quality indicate how wealthy and healthy we are here. Like if we were Flint, Michigan, or Cancer Alley, Mississippi, or whatever, those would be the top priorities. The, um, it was anguish, people were tortured because they, you know, having to choose just three dots, you know, just the three priorities there. <laughs> um, and I, I understand that too. Um, but, but it occurred to me that, I mean, that's also really why we're coming to you. Like we want, the things that will have the biggest carbon bang for our buck. Yeah. And, and we hope that that's where you're gonna lead us because this, these are all, this is all beautiful stuff and it's all top, top priorities for us, but we need to do everything that we can for the global climate reduction. And so if there's one thing up there that does that better, that's where Josh feels it should go. Thank you, I appreciate that, Josh. There's so many questions that are going to be involved in this within this one question, but it's one I asked a while back of the sustainability uh, committee, and that is how do you measure success? It gets a little bit about what he just asked, and that is where the biggest bang for the buck. Where are we going to see? And, and this is in part what we with Freeport Climate Action now, um, or Freeport Can is really sort of looking at too. Where is the biggest bang for the buck? Where is the biggest impact we can have? Because we don't have time. Mm -hmm. We just don't have time to, to and, and so again, I get back more to, to measurement too, because we, if we can't measure it, we can't manage it. And if we can't manage it, we can't measure it. So I, I really want to know sort of not so much if we, if we just go on that modeling or that real emissions measurement in two or three years, that really won't tell us what we've done. And I just asked the question. Yeah, so I think, you know, that's where, so a couple of things. The, the target that we're talking about, so the emission reduction target, that's really where that's going to help drive the metrics that we have to create to know whether we're achieving it, right? So 
in the plan, once you choose your emissions reduction target, what we can do is say, well, by 2028 or 2030 or 2040, you'll need to have certain actions completed and certain number. I mean, we can even get down to like, how many heat pumps do you need to have installed by a certain date in order to achieve that emission reduction target? So that's where the metrics are really gonna come in. And when I was talking about additional metrics, um, you know, emissions inventory, again, is, is a helpful thing to do, but there are additional metrics that we can help you track and understand year on year if you're seeing improvements and you know, you know, the trend is going the right direction and um, the number of heat pumps that are installed, that's easy to get actually from Efficiency Maine. They give reports on that every year. Um, you know, the number of weatherization projects that have been done within um, Freeport. So we can, what we'll do is suggest the municipal government start to track some of those indicators and that, um, and report on them to, to you all, to the community. So the community can start to see, you know, what direction, which, what trend are we moving towards? And we would like, I was actually just talking about today, trying to create some sort of tool or dashboard. This doesn't exist currently, but, um, you know, Portland and South Portland do this in certain ways. They have a yearly kind of annual report out on their action plan that they do um, to the public to say, this is the progress we made. And Maine Won't Wait just came out with a, a really great dashboard where they track progress um, on a chosen you know, set of metrics and indicators so you can see the progress that the state is making. So that will be a huge part of the implementation of this plan. One of the things too that I, I, when you think about how much new building is going in, the majority of new buildings are gonna have heat pumps. I have no doubt they're being built with that in mind, um, but they will be counted as against what is not being replaced in the older housing. So there's a there's kind of a, a mismatch there, if you will, and we can count heat pumps, but if they're in new construction, then that's not gonna really impact what's already here today. Mm -hmm. So you see what I'm saying? It's kind of a miscalculation. Well, I think there's ways that we can measure that though as well. I mean, we know how many new buildings are going, you know, we can we can track how many new buildings are going in and then we know the number of heat pumps. So they're, the differential should be in renovations and that kind of thing. So I think it really is getting down to understand what is the metric you're trying to measure and what will tell you the best story and give you the best understanding of, of what progress you're really making. Um, and that you know will certainly fall to, to Medi and the municipal government to, to be looking at what data can we collect that is easy enough to get and can help us understand where we're at. Hi, I was wondering if you could give us an example of the granularity of the next session, the one where you're going to give the actions. Yeah. And just kind of so help us set our expectations of what kind of things we should expect, maybe from some of the other plans you've done and what kind of recommendations were made at that stage. Yeah, so we'll do something similar in the sense that we'll look at um, different sectors. So we'll look at transportation, we'll look at um, stationary energy, like building energy and residential versus commercial. And we'll have a bunch of action suggestions. Like, you know, the great thing is that you are not the first town to create a climate action plan. There's, um, you know, there's best practices um, nationally and internationally that we have to draw from. So it's, um, we're not reinventing the wheel, which is great news for me, as we're doing a lot of these right now. Um, so there is a great sort of set of standard best practices and actions um, that we'll have per sector that you can go around and talk about and, um, and there may be stuff, like I said, there will be things that aren't on there that you want to see that maybe are more, um, you know, more transformational. But um, I don't know exactly what it will look like, but it will look like something like this, but much more focused on the action levels. And we'll kind of look at it per sector is what we've done um, in Falmouth, but have a similar sort of you know, very interactive. And we'll do a, a survey as well during that time. So we'll, we'll help capture, you know, the broader public's input there as well. Anybody else? You all have great questions. I could do this all night. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we're at time, 7.54. We got a few minutes. Yes, Kathleen. Um, have, you been able have you been able to make a relationship with L.L. Bean? Are um, <clears throat> be an outsider. Um, it, it, it seems so hard to um, to incorporate them into the much of the work we do. It feels like we're kind of drifting around them. And there's this huge place in the middle, which um, 
I don't know what their language is around all of this, and it would be just wonderful if we could get much more, um, mm, you know, if we could begin to share the same values and have the, and work together. So anyway, I just, yeah. I want to mention, I feel like that's like the ghost in the room <laughs> so often. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, it's, it's clear from tonight that the business community is a huge stakeholder here. And so we can work with um, Medi and the other municipal staff to think about the best ways to engage um, the business community in these and hopefully get somebody maybe to come to the action planning workshop and other representatives from the business community. Because I think, I mean, it's very clear that is a, that's a huge um, component of, of the town. So that's great feedback. We'll do our best. I do not have personal LLB relationships, but we'll, we'll do what we can. <laughs> I, know. I know. I would be somewhere else probably. That was <laughs> no, this is my life's work. Don't worry. Um, okay. Anybody else? Great. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. And Bali, do you have any closing plugs you want to give? I just want to say thank you. Thank you for coming, and please keep checking the website, keep advertising the survey. A lot of people who are probably super knowledgeable and have a lot to say haven't said it here, so they can say it through the survey. And come back. Please come back in the fall. Thank you. Thank you all.